Okay, welcome to the May 2nd edition of the Fats, Fuels, and Oils webinar. It's good to be back. Uh, last week, I was at a conference for uh, sustainable aviation fuel, and it was a um, it was a conference that was held by one of my clients, and and they kind of did a an invitation only thing, and so the the group was a little bit different than I think you find it at, at a lot of conferences. And it was a lot of the people in the airplane manufacturing business, a couple of producers, um, and then policy people and, and analysts and, and that kind of thing. So it was a it was a little bit different. And there were a couple of things there that that surprised me. Uh, one, to the extent that those people represent the industry and, and most of the I think most of the end users, at least the US end users were there. Um, they, um, they feel that uh, if you think about the split between uh, of SAF production between renewable diesel and ethanol, they all basically assume that renewable diesel is gonna provide the majority of, of SAF production in the in the coming years uh however the uh one person that presented on sort of the, a bunch of policy stuff but he had a slide that was kind of the feed there his assumption about the feedstock mix going forward um he had a big increase in in cellulosic production out past 20 30 and, and out past 2035, really. I didn't get a chance to talk to him to kind of ask him about his assumptions behind that, but um, but I plan to because I thought that that was, uh, that was an interesting assumption given the struggles that uh, cellulosic has had sort of getting off the ground or, or meeting the, uh, the expectations of the RFS for the history of the RFS really. Um, and, and that leads to sort of the next part. I presented on alternative feedstocks. So stuff like uh, camelina oil and, and that kind of stuff. And they all seemed much more interested in, in those alternative feedstocks than they did in, um, in sort of the veg, certainly soybean oil um or vegetable oils for the thing that they were kind of least interested about um and and then to the extent that they were interested in the stuff that we talk about every week it was more about used cooking oil um than it was anything else i don't know if if those assumptions and and sort of the way that the industry feels about the the feedstock side of things is Due to the fact that at this point SAF production is relatively small, and so they are at the beginning end of of the learning curve for uh, the feedstock markets and in sort of what's possible, or whether they're um, they are that's kind of their aspiration is that um, not to necessarily contribute to the whole kind of food versus fuel debate that they would sort of like to sidestep that whole part of it. Um, but it it just surprised me that that those were the areas that they were that they were kind of focused on at this point. Um, and the and the the split between renewable diesel and, and ethanol also surprised me, especially given the fact that renewable diesel is going to have uses other than SAF and um and ethanol increasingly will have limited applications due to uh the electrification of of or ev e electric vehicles uh and so the ethanol guys are going to have to figure out something to do with their with their plants ultimately and and saf makes a, a lot of sense to me and there's a lot of um there's a lot of of ethanol capacity we produce 14 billion pounds of or 14 billion gallons a, a year of, of ethanol. Um, and 
in theory, most or, or all of that demand is is going to go away over the next however long you think that that demand is, is going to go away. And at that point, it, it seems like SAF is, is going to be sort of one of their only options, unless they all start producing whiskey, I suppose. Um, so I think that it was interesting and it was interesting to get that perspective. I'm not sure. I, th I think I, I kind of assume that that perspective will change on the ethanol to renewable diesel question. I think that still is an open question. Like I said, obviously the ethanol plants are going to need to do something. Um, and it's, it's not a hundred percent clear that, um, that they have any options outside of SAF eventually. Um, but that was certainly not the way that um, the way that the people that I talked to and in, in the presenters felt at, at this particular conference anyway. Um, okay, with that, uh, let's get into our usual kind of stuff. All right, so this week, and you'll notice this when you go and, and look at the, I haven't posted the articles yet, but I think all of the, the data in the forecast are, are updated. Um, I just saved them and refreshed the website. So if they're not immediately, they, they will be shortly. And I'll, I'm going to write articles and post articles this, uh, this afternoon. However, what you'll notice is a is a significant change in the outlook for um, for soybean oil prices, and there are I'm I'm kind of at this point I'm a little torn, honestly, um, because I am increasingly bearish for soybean prices, but at the same time we're at the point or or the the March. Uh, fats and oils data for soybean oil suggested that soybean oil demand is a little bit stronger than I had anticipated and then I anticipated to kind of continue to get stronger going through the rest of the year and the in the EIA data even though it's a couple of months old kind of also reflected the same thing so I'm kind of torn between these two ideas that um, that soybean prices could go down significantly from current levels, uh, but soybean oil use is starting to recover from the, the inventory overhang we had at the beginning of the year, and, and that can support soybean oil prices. However, there is that relationship between soybean oil and, and soybean prices, and falling soybean prices will ultimately drag soybean oil prices lower especially given the fact that um, meal prices kind of continue to hold up. Meal demand remains relatively strong, although the, the fats and oils uh, data kind of showed that meal demand slowed a little bit, at least relative to last year. It still is historically high, but the last couple of months had been above last year's level. And then this year or this month, March, kind of fell a little bit below that. But the, so what I want to do is kind of explain why I'm so bearish soybeans and then go through some of the data on, on soybean oil and then kind of talk about price at the end and then we'll kind of try and go through the um, our usual uh, biofuel margin stuff if it has updated and we have time at the end. Okay, so the first thing uh that is going to have a significant impact on soybean prices here over the next three to six months really is how quickly farmers can get the crop into the ground in the U.S. and then of course U.S. weather during the the growing season and as you can see farmers are off to a pretty good start certainly faster than last year and, and above the five-year average now, the weather forecast does call for a couple of inches of rain over the next couple of weeks. However, most of that rain comes in sort of tenths of an inch per day, which is generally not how, I mean, unless it's just going to be cloudy and, and drizzly every day, which is not typically what you see in the spring in, in the Corn Belt. Um, it typically, 
typically comes in as a frontal passage and you get some rain and then the fields are wet and then they dry out and then farmers get back to planting. Um, and so there are only a couple of days, like four days, I think, where there's a third of an inch of, of rainfall predicted um, for those days in the Corn Belt. And because of the, the way the, the forecast is, is predicting the rain, it seems less likely that the total, the total may be correct, but the number of days that it rains, probably there's probably a little less confidence in that. Um, and as a result, I would expect that farmers probably will get the, the bulk of the crop into the ground here over the next two to three weeks. Last year, if you remember, and you can see in the chart, farmers got off to kind of a slow start and then things cleared up and then they planted just bam, 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 and got most of the crop in uh, over a period of, of three to three to four weeks. And if they've got clear weather this year, they can do that, except they're starting from a, um, having more of the crop planted than they did last year. So that is really the first big hurdle, I guess, in the U.S. growing season or any growing season. Um, and at this point, it looks like that's not necessarily going to be a problem. There isn't anything in the weather right now that suggests that that'll be a problem. And really, you would have to have flooding at a level that we just aren't going to see this year because even in the Red River area where there were concerns about flooding because of the rapid melt of the snowpack, that has kind of come and gone without really too much, uh, too many problems. And so uh, farmers will get the crop in early and that will weigh on prices. Now, assuming that um, we have normal growing conditions in the US and then normal growing conditions in, um, in South America, this is the thing that really has has turned my whole forecast for the oilseed complex uh, from kind of flattish to maybe a little bit higher to really down as hard as as I can as I can predict it. And I I probably would have liked to have gone down further in in most things, but it was just starting to stretch sort of what the normal relationship is going from one month to the next in, in prices. And the, the main thing is that in South America, uh, we expect that the end of the La Nina means that South American production will return to normal levels. Given the size of the Brazilian crop this year, we would expect that they will produce at least that much next year. So they're going to produce 156 to 160, whatever your number is, a uh, ton, million tons of, of soybeans this year. They probably are going to increase acreage a little bit next year. And so you probably get another at least 5 million tons. I, in, in, I would say that you could probably even get more than that because this year, Rio Grande de Sol, which produces about 20 million tons of, of soybeans, looked a whole lot like Argentina. And so even if they didn't change their acreage, you could get another 10 million tons uh, about out of, out of RGBS. Uh, and so 165 million tons may be even a little bit conservative in terms of, of Brazilian production. Uh, the big increase, obviously, is Argentina from sort of a historically low yield of 26 million tons um, back up to something that's more normal um, and maybe even a little higher uh, of 47 million tons. And then on top of that, you get Paraguay adding another 5 million tons. And so if you look at the, at the change in production and in sort of the major producing regions of, of the world, or at least uh, the US and, and then South America, uh, you get an additional 1.44 billion bushels of soybeans next year. And theoretically, what that could mean is that the U.S. crop, although this won't really work out this way, but theoretically, you could almost say that the U.S. crop is just grown for domestic consumption and South America will take care of, of the rest of the world. 
Now, the U.S. exports about 2 billion bushels of soybeans a year, depending a lot on, on China's demand. China probably will continue to, to import soybeans from the U.S. just because of the seasonality of, of production. However, I think that um, what you saw this year with the, the record Brazilian production was a, a really widespread between Brazilian prices and, and U.S. prices right now, or over the last couple of weeks. It's narrowed recently. And of course, you would expect that Brazilian harvest is just done, the crop is just getting to the ports, and so that, that should happen. However, if you think about this sort of in the longer term from kind of a higher level um, and, and just kind of more, more broadly, um, and you think that U.S. biofuel feedstock demand is going to continue, continue to increase the demand for crush, of course, it will be constrained by um, the U.S. crushing industry's capacity, but if you just kind of assume that that is going to continue to grow, ultimately it puts pressure on, on exports in the same way that we've seen soybean oil exports fall off from 1.7 billion pounds last year to, to 500 million pounds this year. It doesn't take that much of a reduction in U.S. exports to take our ending stocks from historically tight sort of pipeline levels up to four or 500 million bushels, which is kind of comfortable, um, and potentially up to maybe a, a billion bushels. Now, before we go get to a billion bushels and before this really sort of gets out of hand, of course, then the premium between Brazil and, and, and the U.S. would probably narrow and, and our exports probably would, would end up kind of balancing that out. But I think the point here really is that after several years of, of relatively tight soybean supplies, this next year looks like it could be a return to ample soybean supplies and, and growing U.S. ending stocks that could grow more than beyond the sort of comfortable level. We saw this happen in in like 2016, 17, I think 2018 maybe, um, where soybean ending stocks were sort of 800, 900 million bushels, which is, is historically high. Um, and prices fell down uh, after trading about where they are now um, between 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, in that area, there were really three years with really tight stocks, and then we we built stocks um, pretty dramatically over the next couple of years, at least. And I think that we're going to kind of enter that period again. And and again, all of this assumes sort of normal growing conditions. But if that happens, and and U.S. exports again fall by. 200 million bushels from 2.1 or 2 billion bushels to 1.8. Um, that's not a huge reduction in, in U.S. shipments. And that gets us at least to the, to the comfortable level. Um, conversely, because South America will have, Brazil have enough soybeans to export as soybeans to, to China. Again, not every, every ounce of, of Chinese demand, but a lot of Chinese demand and maybe more Chinese demand than, um, than you would assume if you looked at kind of the historical series. And Argentina will have enough soybeans to crush to supply uh, soybean oil and soybean meal. And then in addition, the US probably will crush more soybean meal uh, or more soybean, will probably produce more soybean meal than it needs and, and also feed into the, um, into the export market. Um, so the fact that that will happen and, and meal prices probably will come down, that will help support soybean oil prices. Um, but again, if you get, if you get soybean prices, the November contract is trading around 1275 or something. If you get the, um, soybean futures to drop down to, to 10 or, or below 10, 
it's hard to imagine that soybean oil prices are going to trade at, at 60 cents or, or 70 cents. Okay, so that's the bearish side of the case. And now let's kind of go into the, the bullish side, um, which is kind of the soybean oil demand. So on um, Friday, we got uh, the latest uh, production, uh, renewable fuel production and, and feedstock data from the EIA uh, for February. You can see the production was down a little bit in February. That's not really surprising. It was still above our expectations by about 8 million gallons, I think. And based on that and, and sort of what it implies kind of seasonally for the rest of the year, we raised our, our forecast. Um, by uh, about 100 million gallons, maybe a little bit less than 100 million gallons from uh, from last month. And year over year, it looks like about 900 million gallons of additional production this year compared to uh, compared to last year. And so with production continuing to grow, obviously feedstock demand is is going to go up. And then the question just becomes, what is that mean for soybean oil? And do we have enough soybean oil to kind of feed that, that demand? And do we have enough of the other feedstocks to feed that demand? And what I'll kind of say broadly at this point is that um, what has been surprising to me over the last three or four months really has been the volume of, of well, other feedstocks, particularly stuff like tallow and choice white grease, um, have been able to grow. the The demand for feedstock has has grown, and the non biofuel demand has also kept up more than I thought it would, and in some cases has grown. In choice white grease, it's grown. I think it's also growing in in bleachable fancy tallow, if, if I remember correctly. Um, and so typically when I do sort of the longer term forecasts, what I have to ultimately do is kind of cut that non-biofuel demand down. And what I think a lot of people in the industry have thought is that as feedstock demand rises, then we're going to have to find substitutes for the, the non-biofuel demand. And I still think ultimately that that is true. But I would have thought that it would have been, given where we are right now, I would have thought that it would have been a little bit more, um, there would have been a little bit more pressure on the non-biofuel demand uh, currently than there, than there has been, or, or over the last couple of months, six months, whatever, than there has been. Um, and so we'll see, of course, you know, the last couple of months we had kind of the the supply overhang because there were some issues with production. Um, and so we'll see if if that continues over the next couple of months. I think they'll be really important to kind of define that trend. Um, but so far, other than sort of limiting exports, the growth in, in feedstock demand hasn't really had a significant impact on, um, on other domestic usage. For the for most of the most of the feedstocks, uh, the yield I show this just because um, it continues to surprise me. This is EIA data against EIA data, so this is the total feedstocks that EIA reports, or or the feedstocks that uh, there's a couple of things that they kind of don't report. But I assume that those totals aren't aren't. 200 million pounds a, a month or something like that. Um, the yield remains at the lower end of the range and, and below, I think, what uh, what it's it's below the lower end of, of our range of, of feedstock yields that we use in our assumptions. This ultimately means that either there's something that we're missing, there's um, either production in here in included in that number and I do think that includes like naphtha and, and so that would tend to make the yield a little bit lower or the producers are are more efficient than than we assume and I think at some point we're going to have to figure out whether we want to continue to use the yield 
assumptions that we use or whether we're going to want to go back and, and revisit those and, and change those a little bit because our soybean oil assumption is 7.5 pounds and that's that's one of the lower assumptions and so if it comes in and, and our average assumption is 7.1 then going forward then uh, we're always going to be overestimating uh, feedstock demand and so I show this just to kind of um, to highlight that point uh, but um, I think that if you really could get kind of the real biodiesel, renewable diesel production broken out, I think that you would find maybe the yields are a little bit different than the EIA on EIA data implies. Oops. Ugh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. All right, come on. Okay, so the other thing that uh, the EIA reported was capacity. And so this chart just shows the uh, our assumptions about capacity or our forecast for capacity over the last couple of years. And if you look at this chart, um, I think the interesting, the really interesting thing about this chart is is if you sort of look at the progression that we've gone through. So our oldest forecast in this chart is the orange line, which is June 2020. Um, and if you look from there to kind of October 2022, you didn't see a, a huge change. Um, but then we had the problems in, in sort of January, and it looked like things were going to be slower than expected. And so expectations for uh, when capacity was going to come online fell down. Um, and then both expectations and then actual realized capacity, or, or at least the capacity that's been reported by the EIA, both have started to shift back up. And I think that the shift down in, in capacity had a lot to do with why there was such weakness in feedstock prices early in the year. And I think that the, um, the, the reverse of that um, is something that could help support prices kind of going forward. If you look at, at prices, obviously uh, last week soybean oil prices came up quite a bit, um, but the, uh, the fat and grease prices have been stable and, and are starting to go up. And so potentially there is this sort of four to six week lag between movement in soybean oil and, and movement in the other feedstock prices, but this doesn't necessarily feel like that. And we're going to, I'm going to show you what those price relationships are a little bit later. Um, but it, it feels like there, there is starting to be kind of a, a bit of a disconnect between soybean oil and the fat and grease prices. And I think part of the reason for that is because of this anticipation of the significant increase in soybean prices and the idea that uh, the U.S. domestic market is going to have sufficient supplies for crushers to basically crush as much as they want and or as much as they can and produce enough soybean oil that uh, at least in the short term next year or two, uh, at the very least, there are ample feedstock supplies. Um, and so while I think that the rise in capacity obviously means more feedstock demand overall, uh, the preference for renewable diesel producers to use fats and greases may be shifting the relationship between soybean oil and the fat and grease prices. That's one. And then the other is obviously this kind of the what we've gone through with the, the declining expectations for capacity or when capacity is coming online and then that trend ending and expectations for when capacity is coming line, online and actual realized capacity coming online exceeding those expectations also probably is going to shift the um, the tone for the feedstock markets going forward. However, if soybean prices are going to be under pressure from, or if soybean oil prices are kind of under pressure from falling soybean prices, 
ultimately that is going to limit the upside price risk. All right, and then this one, which this is one of my favorite charts, uh, capacity utilization. You can see that based on uh, the EIA reported capacity, and this is actually the EPA RIN generation data um, is what we use kind of as a substitute for production. Uh, capacity utilization dropped down uh, even further in, in February. I don't think that's a surprise. Again, that was in the heart of, of when companies were having issues with getting their facilities up and running, getting their pretreatment going. Um, but the question remains sort of what is going to be the long-term average uh, for the uh, capacity utilization. And you can see um, our, the, the, over the last four months, it's been 53%. That's actually down 5% from, from last month. Um, we've got it at 60% for 2023, in part because of, you know, we started the year off so weekly that you, you're including those numbers in the average and that's gonna drag the average down. Um, we're really above that for most of, of the year. I think once we get the, um, the March and, and April data, that'll really kind of tell us where things are, are going to stand kind of going forward. Um, but capacity utilization for renewable diesel, as I talked about endlessly, um, you know, a couple of months ago, will make a huge difference between what uh, the total feedstock demand is, or or projected feedstock demand is, and uh, and and swings in capacity utilization can have a, a pretty big impact on my forecast for soybean oil usage and fats and grease usage and and everything else. Um, over the last year, you can see the average was 74%. No, I guess I let that run down into the other line there. All right, so if we are going to increase capacity and, uh, and increase capacity utilization, what do we think about um, the feedstock mix? And you can see here that uh, the, the portion of the total feedstock usage and this is for renewable diesel, biodiesel, everything. This is just what the EIA reports is, is feedstock usage. Um, soybean oil's percent of that total has kind of been a little weak the last two years. It's been below the, the long-term average. You would kind of expect that as renewable diesel comes online and those plants favor uh, non-bio or fat and grease feedstocks over, over soybean oil for um, CI purposes. However, it looks like as we get later into this year, we've got expectations that soybean oil will start to, soybean oil's percentage will start to rise. The key to this assumption is whether, or the key to whether this will actually verify or not is going to be whether um, this idea that tallow can kind of meet the feedstock demand and meet the, the non-biofuel demand and non-biofuel is still competitive enough with biodiesel or biomass-based diesel that it doesn't, biomass-based diesel doesn't necessarily kind of steal supply away from, from that non-biofuel demand. If that's the case, then ultimately soybean oil probably is going to start to rise in terms of its portion of, of the overall feedstock mix. However, there are other reasons that I think that soybean oil may also, um, may also start to rise in, in the feedstock mix. One is if you have, if you're doing something else to lower your CI score, if you're doing carbon sequestration or you're doing other things, there are other ways beyond just the feedstock mix to lower your CI score. And so, um, it, soybean oil doesn't, it doesn't rule out the use or, or the increasing use of, of soybean oil. Now, I'm a soybean oil analyst, and so there may be uh, some preference here that is just innate in me that it's sort of the old saying, 
if you're a hammer, everything you look, you see looks like a nail, that kind of thing. So maybe every solution to me is is more soybean oil um, or cowbell. Uh, but it looks like if you are going to have the non-biofuel demand relatively steady in the fat increases, and you're going to increase um, capacity and capacity utilization that soybean oil is, is going to have to increase as a portion of the of the total feedstock mix. The other reason is that uh, the relative price of, of soybean oil and the other feedstocks has really started to narrow. We saw it kind of blow out over 2020, 2021, when soybean oil prices really took off. Um, but that started to narrow down, and I'll show you a chart of, of that here in, the, in a couple of minutes, but that is a trend that I think could extend on because of this, this increase in, in soybean supplies and the fact, that, um, the fact that U.S. crushers are likely to have sufficient supplies to crush as much as they need to. Um, to meet the demand. And so if that's the case, then uh, there also will be an economic incentive for producers to use more soybean oil. Uh, this is just kind of um, showing the results of, of the EIA data. Uh, this is daily average soybean oil used in, in biodiesel production. You can see we're kind of following uh, last year's trend uh, over the last couple of months. Um, we've got it coming down a little bit in the, um, in the coming months. However, I think that, um, we have been a little low on our soybean oil usage and our, and our biodiesel production forecasts. And so ultimately it wouldn't surprise me if, if this number is a little bit higher than our expectations and in remains closer to the five-year average line going forward or, or above the 21-22 line going forward uh, for most of the year. Um, you can see we've got it down. We've got the, the marketing year total down about 300 million pounds. So maybe it's not down quite that much. Maybe it's down just a little bit sort of uh, year over year, or maybe it's unchanged year over year ultimately. For renewable diesel, this is really where um, we see obviously the big growth in demand and you can see that despite sort of a, a slow start, we have this kind of going up and to the right uh, through the end of the marketing year. Again, this is based on the idea that uh, as, as capacity grows and as capacity utilization rises, as long as the non-biofuel end users for the other feedstocks can remain competitive with bio, uh, biomass-based diesel producers, renewable diesel producers, really, um, that they are effectively going to have to uh, use soybean oil. And given uh, a sharp decline in soybean prices, that soybean oil um, will be economically attractive too. Now, all of that said, uh, my expectation here, or, or I guess the risk here, probably is the opposite of biodiesel, where uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if if the realization of of this forecast is is probably a little bit lower. I don't think that it's going to be kind of sort of flatline at at ten uh, throughout the rest of of the year, just because of the growth in in um, in renewable diesel capacity, and so. Maybe it's not as as steep a line up as I'm showing right now, but I think that you probably kind of, at the very least, continue to slowly increase soybean oil usage and renewable diesel production through the through the end of the year, and then again, depending on what the non biofuel demand does, um, maybe even a little bit more than that. Um, okay, and so then this is this is just total soybean oil domestic demand relative to uh, last year and, uh, and the, the five-year average. The surprising part in here, if you looked at this chart a couple of months ago, when I showed it, the, the increase in 
um, in demand sort of happened a little bit later than what we have realized so far. I think we probably had February and March both below at least 21, 22, and, and I think it was probably below uh, 22, 23, probably much closer to the five-year average than, um, than this chart shows. And then we kind of expected in the April to May period that you would get this rising demand and, um, and that would support prices kind of going forward. Um, and so demand has been stronger than, than we expected. Um, we'll see whether that kind of continues or whether demand is, is uh, whether the, whether the non-biofuel demand starts to slow down at all. Uh, one of the big takeaways from the initially the NOPA report on the 15th last month, and then that was basically confirmed by the, the USDA data that was released yesterday, was the strength of domestic demand in, in um, March. And a big part of that was uh, we assume non-biofuel demand remaining relatively strong. Now we have, because of the things that you've seen, we have obviously really strong forecasts for soybean oil feedstock use and for um, for March, kind of what we don't have is, is the biofuel component. And so maybe non-biofuel demand is a little bit weaker than we assume. However, it looks like um, it looks like domestic demand we already know, and, and domestic demand again was was relatively strong. So um, it there is a good chance that uh, that this is a little bit stronger than uh, than we expect, especially as as prices kind of have come down too. Um, there will there won't necessarily be a lot more demand just because prices come down because this stuff goes into um you know everything basically but it's it's economically sensitive but not in the same way that uh, rolex watches are i guess um this is in shampoo and salad dressing and, and stuff that gets used every day so um it's not like all of a sudden if prices come down we're going to start dumping a lot more salad dressing on our salads um, however, I think that uh, prices coming down could make it so that um, that end users are are increase buying and production marginally. And if non biofuel demand holds up, and we get the uh, the build out in biofuel demand, then this could be the the risk here is is has been and probably will continue to be sort of to the upside a little bit. Now, we're above USDA by a significant amount. So, you know, I think they probably are going to have to come up ultimately some. Um, and if, they're, if the risk is to the upside, then, uh, well, I guess I, I should say non-biofuel risk is probably to the upside. Overall domestic demand for us, our, our forecast probably is at the upper end of, of the range that it could be. So, sorry, I, sh I should clarify that. All right, so I, I, I was trying to get this chart done just before um, this started, and so that's why it doesn't look very good or um, there isn't really anything else to it. Um, but what I wanted to show here really is we've just gotten um, the uh, the averages for April, and this is essentially the price of crude to gum soybean oil in Illinois minus the price of the other feedstocks, uh, DCO or or inedible tallow or or UCO. Um, in Illinois, if if we report Illinois or in the uh, in the most liquid market that we report otherwise. Um, and what you can see again, obviously, is that uh, that the prices really blew out in 2021 or that price spread really blew out in 2021. And since then it's it's kind of been working its way back down. 
um, to the point where I think that uh, we probably are going to, at this point, we probably are at sort of the historical average. If you kind of look here, this is where most things are. If you kind of look back here, we assume that this is around the long-term average in, in 2019. Um, we probably are, are pretty close to the long-term average. Our forecast now, because I went in and, and slashed the soybean oil forecast, and then when I went in and looked at the fat and grease forecasts, um, they, if you look at them relative to soybean oil, um, they would be too low relative to their own supply and demand and their recent historical prices. It doesn't mean that they can't go down, but again, sort of based on what we've seen recently in, in terms of prices and, um, and our expectation for supply and demand going forward, it does seem like the fat and grease prices are have maybe found a bottom and at the very least probably will go sideways and maybe a little bit higher, but not necessarily follow uh, soybean oil lower. And if we just go out to the end of, of 2023, we don't really get too far out of the range of uh, too far below the historical range. Um, we will see if this really plays out. This is something that uh, we think about the relationship between these prices all the time. And we've known that they've been narrowing, um, but this idea that uh, that for some reason, this idea that South America is going to produce a lot more soybeans next year, and that's going to weigh on soybean oil prices is is just now sort of that whole picture is just kind of recently started to fit together for me. Um, and so because of that, I think that we probably will at the very least remain in in sort of the long term historical range. And there probably is a good chance that we go into the below that range, at least for some period of time. And this is why I also think that, um, that potentially soybean oil, this makes soybean oil more competitive in the feedstock mix. And so ultimately this could mean that, um, that soybean oil's percent of the total feedstock mix is, is more than, um, than it has been back here when, you know, it's 20 cents above um, just in terms of pounds, uh, it's 20 cents above the price of, of most of the other feedstocks. Um, and so I think that that is, is sort of why I'm, I'm struggling with this idea that soybean, I'm really bearish for soybean prices. Um, and as a result, I've, I've pulled my soybean oil forecast down pretty dramatically. But if you look at the at the demand side of of soybean oil, uh, even if even if we can crush as much as as um, even if we can crush at at full capacity, um, the demand is still strong enough that I think that uh, the impact on soybean oil prices will probably be mitigated a little bit. However, uh, it won't necessarily keep soybean oil prices from, um, from falling relative to the other feedstocks. And then that sort of, again, feeds back into using a little bit more soybean oil, which may moderate um, this a little bit. We'll kind of see, and I'm, I'm gonna continue to fine tune this uh, obviously over the next couple of weeks. And, and at some point I'll, I'll have a settled and firm opinion on exactly where we'll end up. But I kind of wanted to highlight um, this trend because we haven't talked about this at all. Okay, and this chart is a little, it's a little odd, um, but I wanted to show it because um, the cycle that we're in now is, is in some ways similar to um, what happened when biodiesel first came on the scene and and the biodiesel industry was was built out. And so if you kind of trace soybean oil prices, if you look back sort of pre-biomass pre based diesel before we used any of it to produce fuel, um, the average price 
was around 25 cents or that was the average price for the couple of years that I have um, that I included in this anyway. I'm more interested in the average price during uh, during the biodiesel period. And if you look, uh, we started to um, we started to use soybean oil and biodiesel a long time ago, and um, it really kind of the the peak of the biodiesel build out sort of occurred just a little bit after the um, well with the passage of the RFS, and then a little bit after the ethanol build out. And so if you look at the prices, and then the the other metric is days of coverage, the ending stocks for that month divided by um, the usage for the next month. So if we stopped producing soybean oil today, how many days would we have before we ran out of soybean oil as a way to kind of re uh, relate inventory to, um, to usage? All right, so you can see 06, 07, uh, oh, uh, 07, 08, 08, 09, 9, 10, 10, 11, 11, 12. In this period, uh, this is kind of where you had a, a, a big expansion in both biodiesel and, and ethanol production. Um, and you also had tightening stocks. So back here, this was the period where I was talking about soybean stocks kind of fell down to sort of pipeline levels, very similar to kind of where we are today and where we have been the last couple of, of years today. Um, and if you look at sort of that general arc, and then you get prices falling in 13, 14, even though inventories tighten relative to usage. Now, intuitively, this is a, this should be a good predictor of price. I will say days of coverage is not the world's best predictor of price for for a bunch of reasons, but it just just from a correlation perspective, it's it's not that fantastic, but it works to to illustrate some things. So thirteen fourteen, you can see that uh, again, despite the fact that that stocks tightened relative to demand, you still had um, prices come down because you had sort of the same thing that we've had here, which is a bit of speculative fever that really ran prices up to at that point kind of record levels above fifty cents. Uh, and then, again, even though fundamentally you would you would think, oh yeah, prices will continue to go up, prices have come down. And if you look at the at the couple of black dots, which are I've sort of called the renewable diesel build out period, the last three years, even though we've used soybean oil and, and renewable diesel for for longer than that, we've had a very sharp move up. And now it looks like we are starting down this same sort of of uh, pathway. And so the 2022 or 22, 23 average, because we had uh, higher prices earlier, um, is still probably a little bit uh, higher than obviously where we are today, um, and maybe a little bit higher overall. But I think that what you might find is that going forward, no matter what happens with supply, um, that prices will kind of continue to come down. And that's what I've tried to start to reflect in my um, in my forecast. Now, the difficult bit is trying to balance the the, the growth in demand with the um, with the, the potential for more supply and and falling soybean prices. All right, that is that for today. Um, what time is it? It's two o'clock. All right, we've got lots of questions, and I'm not a hundred percent sure that the uh, the margin stuff is is updated anyway. So I would rather take your questions, and then um, and then we can uh, look at the margin stuff next week. Uh, will that surplus of soybeans in twenty three twenty four end up as U.S. ending stocks in 23-24, or will the timing of the South American supplies push the surplus into the 24-25 balance sheet? Um, it, it, this is a really great question. It could be 23-24 uh, U.S. ending stocks. A lot of that will ultimately depend on uh, what you think of Chinese crush 
demand and and as a result Chinese imports. I think that um, I think my Chinese crush number is a little bit lower than some of the other people that I've spoken with. And so as a result of that, China can take a little bit, China's demand for US imports at the beginning of the 23, 24 marketing year isn't as strong as, um, as it would be otherwise. And that means that at least some of that surplus ends up as, as US stocks. If I had to sort of guess if, if, if you kind of think of this as maybe two to 400 million bushels in, in additional ending stocks over the next couple of years, we sort of build two to 4 million bushels of, of US ending stocks. I would guess that, that 23, 24 will be closer to the, the sort of 200 million bushel increase um, and then kind of continue to build from there. So 24, 25, you continue to build, but that's probably from this year's level, um, probably closer to the, the 400 million bushel uh, increase. Um, now, if Chinese crush demand ends up being significantly stronger than I expect, then I think that China probably still there's there's probably one year left where China will still really rely on the U.S. during the uh, during the U.S. export window for significant supplies. I mean, they will always prefer to take some some U.S. beans during that period because um, because prices will just always there will be a, a um, the U.S. price will be lower than the Brazilian price at that time, and they like to level load their their imports obviously um but i think the 23 24 could be sort of the last year of, of sort of the old regime where um where china takes more soybeans from brazil but they still take a, a significant amount of soybeans from the us call it 20 call it 20, between 25 and 30 million tons i guess somewhere in there that's a wide range i understand but it again it will depend a lot on on how strong chinese crush demand is um i think one of the one of the key things that has been that i've gotten wrong over the past year is i had assumed that in recovering from asf and building out the the hog the big hog hotels in china sort of the shift from um from farm from people having a couple pigs in the backyard to modern industrial farming in china would be more soybean meal and intensive than it has turned out to be i don't know if that is because we still are in the shift um, or whether that actually is is just the way that they are, their feed industry is going to work. But either way, the the result of that has been that crush has been a little bit weaker than uh, than I had assumed several months ago. Now I may be swinging too far to the other end, and uh, in Chinese crush may be ultimately may be stronger than I expect. Um, but if it's not, uh, if it's around my expectations, I, again, I would say you probably sort of year over year would ex expect kind of a, a 200 million bushel increase in, in U.S. ending stocks in 2020 or 23, 24, and then, and then build, uh, build from there. Uh, can we expect additional imports of palm oil to replace soybean oil being directed to biofuels, for example, in animal feed? Um, another really good question. So, yeah, and, and we're already starting to see that um, if you look at, at U.S. palm oil imports um, relatively soon, I, I thought about doing it this week, but then I wanted to get into this stuff. Relatively soon, I'm going to dive into sort of where um some of the shifts that are happening we've talked a little bit about um using palm oil for animal feed in the u.s uh before but we've never really gone into the numbers um we've also seen obviously really strong canola oil demand uh as and and that probably will continue as is some of the food industry will shift over to canola oil from from soybean oil uh, the one thing that was a little surprising in in the the fats and oils data, just as an aside, was there was a slowdown in in uh, canola oil 
demand in in March relative to what it has been. It's been really so strong that it was, I think it was gonna be hard to continue. But if you look at it sort of relative to last year, relative to the five-year average, uh, it slowed down a little bit in March. But I wouldn't expect that that, in the long term, I wouldn't expect that to continue. And in similarly for Palm, I don't think we saw a slowdown in, in March, but I just mean in the long term, you'll see more Palm imports uh, for the animal feed industry. And, um, and like I said, maybe we'll go into that uh, in a little bit more detail um, next week. Uh, your current soybean oil 12 month forecast shows an increase from current uh, 52 to 62. Uh, sorry, I'm not reading this well. Shows an increase from, um, from 50 cents to 62 cents by the fall or winter. Do you expect to revisit that down or revise that down based on more stocks than expected? Are you keeping it high because of the non biofuel demand pulling strong on the fats and oils complex? Uh, no, it's just a function of the, the data hasn't updated yet. Like if you're looking at the website now and that's what the forecast looks like. Uh, it has changed. So it is, it's, it's much more in line with, with kind of the current forward curve of, of the futures market. Um, and, and it, it, so I expect prices to go down from, from here, basically. Uh, I'm going to continue to, to fine tune this. I went in and I, I just kind of hacked it, um, because I, felt like this idea of, of South America um, and sort of uh, the price movement that we saw last week all made me feel like I was a little behind. Um, and so I wanted to get the prices down or the price forecast down. Um, and then I will ultimately, I'll come back and, and fine tune that. But um, yeah, once the once the data updates, which I'll try and get it updated again here. It's all updated in the back end. It just needs to come up to the to the website. But once you see that, then you'll see that uh, I'm actually predicting that prices kind of slowly move lower. And, and if you have access to futures prices, or you can go to the CME if if you can't see it, it's it's pretty similar to the forward curve of of the futures market right now. If it takes a little while, it shouldn't take that long. It should actually update pretty quickly. Uh, where will we come up with the, an extra 7 billion pounds of feedstocks in the next year? Um, that is an excellent question. So part of it is, is going to be uh, from increased crush and, and increased crush capacity. Um, part of it is going to be from the continued growth in, um, in imports of stuff like tallow, uh, although I would expect that the growth rate in, in those imports will slow next year relative to what we saw this year and, and last year. We saw some really big growth over the last couple of years, and I would expect that to slow a little bit. Um, I think the bulk of it, if we if we really have to find 7 billion pounds of, of feedstocks, the bulk of it will come from uh, probably um, EUCO, either Domestic UCO production or um, or UCO imports, particularly from uh, from China. I two weeks ago I I talked about UCO imports and I um, I talked about how uh, Canadian imports were were going to increase dramatically and there was a mistake in in my analysis at that point that uh, I very clever client pointed out to me. Um, and when I went back and, and sort of looked at it, if you look at, at Canada, probably it, it's continuing to grow and, and growing pretty pretty quickly, but the bulk of the growth has come from uh, US shipments from China. And if you look at that and you kind of extend just the pace of shipments from uh, Vuco from China uh, over the last couple of months. And if you assume that they can kind of keep that pace up, uh, you can get a lot of, of the supply from, from that. Um, all of that said, that all might not add up to, uh, to 7 billion pounds of, of additional feedstocks. And I am still, struggling a bit. The reason I haven't sort of rolled my uh, my marketing years forward yet, even though USDA will publish their first uh, 
first uh, estimate of the 23-24 marketing year in the next WASD uh, at the end of next week, I think, um, is because I'm, I'm struggling with that question a little bit. But I do ultimately think that um, that the supply is there. And I think that, uh, that Yuko probably plays a, a bigger role in, in that than, than I had thought previously. Uh, somebody's asking, can I send them the, uh, the presentation? Yep. What you need to do is, is send me an email. Uh, if you don't have my email address, it's just my name, Tori, and then the dot, and then Alden, um, at fastmarkets.com. And if you send me a request, I will send you the presentation. Um, longer term, would you expect the soybean oil to become the bottom of the oils and fats market with tallow and UCO selling at a premium to soybean oil as a function of the preference for low CI? So people have asked me for a while sort of this, this kind of CI parity question in, in different forms. And um, my response was always that, well, the CI market only really applies to, to California. And because that's not all of the feedstock market, then, uh, then things can't trade at, at CI parity. Of course, with the introduction, the expiration of the blender's tax credit and the introduction of the, uh, the new credits under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, then CI scores will be important for all of the feedstocks. And I do think that there probably will be uh, some premium for, um, for fats and greases relative to soybean oil due to the, um, due to the, the difference in CI scores. However, uh, ultimately the, um, the supply of those at least uh, let's let's say the supply of everything except for yuko let's set yuko aside for a second all of the other fats and greases the supply is is fixed on some level and i think that in theory and we'll see if this actually turns out to be true but this is what i've been telling people in theory there probably is a is a convenience premium for soybean oil so even though if you just looked at sort of the straight line mathematical equivalents based on CI scores, um, based on whichever program you chose to make the dominant program, or if you sort of divvied them up and kind of said, uh, California is 80% of renewable diesel and, and sort of did it that way. Um, if you looked at those, those mathematical equivalencies, um, there probably would be a, a small premium in there in soybean oil for um, for convenience and for availability, because ultimately, um, as the person that asked the other question, where are we going to find seven billion pounds of uh, feedstocks? The point there really is that you know the fat in Greece supply is is mostly fixed, and because of that soybean oil is going to need to fill in. And as a result, you're going to get um, probably a little bit more price support for soybean oil than the CI equivalents would, um, would suggest. Now, I do think, and again, this is something that it, I'm still working through a little bit, but I do think that sort of this new price regime where the um, the spreads have narrowed and, and they've obviously narrowed, but the question is how one will they stay there and then and then two sort of what do they look like in the, in the long term? Um, I do think that that is probably going to continue for a little bit and and what I'm going to try and sort of figure out uh, going forward is is how long that lasts. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for the great questions this week. Um, next week. We are going to have a uh, a webinar, and then sort of immediately after that, I'm going to dash out of here. Um, the following week, we won't, because the following week is our conference. And so I hope to see many of you or all of you at the conference. Um, and if anybody wants to sort of spend some time talking about uh, whatever you want to talk about at the conference, you can either we can either set something up beforehand or if I'm not talking to anybody or just kind of walking around, please feel free to grab me and, and ask me anything you want. 
Um, and I, I hope to see all of you there. All right, thanks again so much for, uh, for uh, attending this week's webinar and I will see you all uh, next week. All right, have a good week, everybody. Bye-bye.